Good morning, church. Welcome this morning. Welcome for our service for the Feast of Pentecost. Um, we invite you to uh, greet one another, say hello, uh, let us know what you're doing, and of course send us your pictures out there uh, of you wearing red for Pentecost. Uh, our opening hymn this morning is Come, Be Faithful, Raise the Street.
We thank you for your continued support and all that you continue to do for us here at Rockbrook so that we may do for others. Uh, another meal went here, went uh, from here out to the Stephen Center this week. More food went to the pantry. And uh, we thank you for your generosity and your work and your support. And uh, vacation Bible school videos are being shot from time to time. Uh, so uh, it's, it's quite a busy place, even though we, we can't all be in the same room or we can't be doing the same thing, we can do a lot of things. And we thank you for your support. All things come from you, O oh God, and with gratitude we return to you what is truly yours. In gratitude for all your gifts, we offer ourselves, all that we have, all that we are, all that we are able to do in union with Christ's offering for us, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. as we finish out the month of May. This time of year, we're all excited to do summery things. Well, I know right now that you can't always do the things you might normally do because we're all staying at home to be healthy, but I hope you can find other safe ways to enjoy your summer. One of my favorite things about summers in the past is when I could go on a family vacation. When I was a kid, my family would try to go somewhere each summer to relax and discover a new place to visit and learn about. When I got older and became a mom myself, we tried to take family trips when we could. I think it's fun to plan a trip. If you could go anywhere right now for a vacation, where would you choose? The beach? Mountains? A big city? A different country? An amusement park? There are so many fun and exciting places to go. Most of my trips have been road trips in the car. I love a good road trip, don't you? Depending on you where, where you want to go, you have to also plan carefully what to pack in your suitcase. When my kids were little, I used to surprise them with a travel bag full of fun things they could do in the car. I'd fill their travel bag with stuff like coloring or activity books, stickers, crayons, things to read, travel-sized games, maybe a blank notebook for them to write in, or a disposable camera, sunglasses, a stuffed animal, and of course, snacks. By the time we got home, they probably had also put new things in their bag from the places we visited, like books or souvenirs. What would you put in your travel bag if you were going on a trip? Well, guess what? I have been planning a vacation for you, but it's not the normal kind of trip. Since we aren't able to do vacation Bible school here at church like we usually do, we're going to do virtual vacation Bible summer. Starting next Sunday, June 7th, your parents will be able to go online to help you go on a pretend trip each week for five weeks. I've picked out five fun places to visit that tie in with five important Bible stories. I can't wait for you to go on these pretend VBS trips. But, like I mentioned earlier, you need to pack your bag before you travel. So, we have been getting your travel bag ready for you. Your parents will get an email from me with details of how to get your bag. Inside your bag will be fun information, directions, and supplies to help you have VBS at home. You'll get to do all the usual VBS activities like crafts, games, science, music, Bible story, and even sense. Now, if we could only get Janice and her kitchen crew to bring us supper every week, then we'd be set. Seriously though, I'm so thankful for the parents or other helpers out there who will be taking these trips with you and will be your leaders at home. So please enjoy these trips and be kind to your at-home helpers. 
I'll see you next Sunday for our departure day. Oh, and don't forget to be thankful for the one thing that we get to take on our trip that we don't even have to pack. God, he promises to be with you during all that you do this summer. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says, The Lord your God will go with you. He will not leave you or forget you. Please pray with me. Father God, we thank you for our upcoming summer. Please help us to find joy in the new ways that we can celebrate summer, including our new version of VBS. Thank you for all the children and parents who are willing to go on these virtual vacations with you at home. Thank you for all the helpers from our church who have been involved in getting these trips ready. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Spirit, whose breath gives life to the world, 
and whose voice is heard in the soft breeze. We need your strength and wisdom. Cause us to walk in beauty. Give us eyes ever to behold the red and purple sunset. Make us wise so that we may understand what you have taught us. Help us to learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. Make us always ready to come to you with clean hands and steady eyes, so when life fades like the fading sunset, our spirits may come to you without shame. Amen. It has been a, a rough week in the world. And so we pray for ourselves, we pray for our country, we pray that people will find ways to, to get along with one another, that people will take appropriate actions and protest. We pray that this divisiveness will end. As our opening prayer said, God doesn't want us to be separate. God wants us to be as one and as one with God. So let us pray that that may happen, that we may finally reach a place where we can embrace each other, embrace our differences, enjoy the fact that we are different, because it all makes our world that much richer. Lord, be with us. Be with us in patience. Be with us in safety. Be with us now and be with us always. Keep our minds, Lord, on you and on all of your children and all of your creation. Amen. Today I offer up this prayer. It comes to us from up the street and around the corner at the Tri-Faith Initiative. For all who feel vulnerable, May you be safe and protected. For all who experience fear or anxiety, may you know you are not alone. For all in need of care and healing, may we provide strength to those and those who need comfort. For those who face difficult decisions between food on the table or for safety, we stand for policies that recognize your plight. For those who are inequitably impacted, we seek you, we value the dignity of you and of all humanity, and we will work for shared solidarity. For public officials and decision makers, we pray for wisdom and guidance. For you, we thank you for all you do to nurture spiritual wellness in Omaha. May you feel the comfort and support of our collective. Together, let us build a better, safer, more just world. For us, for our church family, for our world, for all that we can do, let us follow God and let us pray now thoughtfully and carefully this excellent prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. Today's reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, 
because each one heard him, them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and res residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken about through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoking mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is Pentecost, the birthday of the church. That first Pentecost that Tyson just read about for us, the Spirit poured into the disciples, and Peter's tongue responded with the words of the prophet Joel. Well, like so many people today, Joel witnessed devastation brought by nature and human oppression. Joel called the people to gather and worship, and to cry out to God, to repent of the ways that cause destruction, and become prophets themselves, dreaming dreams of a better world. Prophets are often called to speak God's truth in times when God has been forgotten or ignored. The Bible tells us that the work of a prophet can be dangerous and challenging. Even today, it is so. Prophecy is often a call to repentance and a call to action, often a call that some people don't want to hear. When we're at our best, Methodists have always been actively prophetic. We have ventured to make things right, to fight injustice, and to actively respond where and when we are needed. A century ago, we developed our first set of Methodist social principles, and we proclaimed what were then radical, crazy ideas, like an end to child labor, public education available for all, and access to health care. On that first Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came to the church as a rushing wind and appeared as tongues of fire. It must have been extraordinary, but there was another miracle happening that day, a miracle of hearing and listening. There was a great crowd in Jerusalem for the Festival of Weeks. It was one of the best parties of the year. Many people came to take part in it. And somewhere in the city, in some nondescript little hiding place, were the disciples. On that day, though, they received the Holy Spirit, and they went out into that crowd of, of partiers and began to preach the good news. Have you ever been in a crowd and tried to get everybody's attention? Have you ever seen me try to get everybody quiet at a funeral lunch so I can offer the prayer? Imagine thousands of people. But that's what the apostles did. They walked out there and they got the people's attention. They not only got their attention, but they got them to listen to the good news that allowed people to hear in their own languages. 
And there were hecklers, as the story tells, and there are naysayers, but at the end of the day, 3,000 new believers were baptized. 3,000 people listened. 3,000 people acted. Today, the church continues to live out the vision of the prophet Joel. We gather, we repent, and we dream. When we gather for worship, we renew that Pentecost miracle. We listen, we repent, we renew our spirits for the task of promoting God's compassion and justice. We seek to continue to prophesy, to be visionary, and dream of how we can make God's world a better place. And we prepare to act. We repent. For what do we repent? Well, it seems the COVID-19 pandemic has shed a particular light on that question. When we look back at those radical concerns that Methodists had 100 years ago, and we take stock and ask those same questions and look at those original social principles, about families, education, children, health care, we're slipping. Children, families, the poor. We have children in our community who are malnourished and hungry. An ongoing problem is access to nutritious food, especially fruits and vegetables. A peculiar sign of malnutrition now is obesity in children. Because these children only have access to junk food. It's a particular problem east of 72nd Street. We have children families, youth, without a roof overhead. Perhaps the saddest are the unemployed and, or the underemployed and the underpaid who have to choose between food or shelter. And although we learned in grammar school that child labor had been eliminated in this country, the fact is that many children must work because their families cannot survive without the additional income. Regarding education, well, I suppose during this time every family with a child in elementary, middle, or high school has a new appreciation for our teachers and our schools. With that new appreciation, will we start paying teachers what they're worth? And another crack in the system is in the education that we send out to our communities related to COVID-19 in general and especially the lack of information that's available in languages other than English. In our area, the lack of information available in Spanish is the cause of higher rates of illness among Hispanic and Latino people. These are the people who are processing our food. This is our problem. And healthcare. Well, on Thursday, I was in a conference with Dr. Ali Khan. He's an epidemiologist who is the Dean of Public Health at the University of Nebraska Med Center, and he chairs the board of the Tri-Faith Initiative. You may have seen him on MSNBC, CNN, or a variety of other shows. He tells us that healthcare is one of the major problems in this country, not just now. This is just showing a new light on it. 10% of people in this country have no access to health care whatsoever, and a significant portion of the 90% who do don't have access to the best health care. We get what we get. According to Dr. Khan, the United States' response to this pandemic has been weak, untimely, and unimaginative, his words. Especially when we have already seen how other countries had responded. He contrasted the United States with South Korea, whose responses started the same day. South Korea now averages four new cases of COVID-19 per day. Four. On Wednesday in Omaha alone, we had 274 new cases of COVID-19. If anything is going to change, we have to hold our elected leaders 
and ourselves accountable for reducing the rate of COVID-19 transmission. There are Asian and European countries that have successfully reopened. They don't have better doctors, they don't have more information, they don't have a vaccine, they have a better plan. And they're carrying it out. And they're cooperating with one another in carrying out the plan. Dr. Khan went on to assert that COVID-19 in the world of pandemics, this is not the big one. Not to belittle those who are suffering, but in the history of pandemics, COVID-19 is just a wee blip on the radar. This should make us stop, and it should be a wake-up call for us to prepare ourselves for the big one, if it really ever does hit, but to let us take stock in how we work with one another how we work for other people's benefit, not just our own. How we can get through a pandemic without everybody panicking and hoarding toilet paper and hand sanitizer so that others cannot have that, which ultimately then makes us less healthy. This is a time for Christians to embrace again the prophetic spirit Pentecost is the time when we lift up the Holy Spirit especially. It is a time when we can take stock because we can make things better for everyone. And if we don't, when anyone suffers, we know there is a ripple effect to society. When any one person suffers, I suffer. You suffer. We all suffer. Faith. Faith is the tool that we need to repair the brokenness that has been brought to light in our country, in our community. It's time to listen, to repent, and to act, just as Joel said thousands of years ago, just as Peter repeated 2,000 years ago, just as we have repeated today. We need to let God come into our hearts and really listen to God, through whomever God is speaking at that moment, and it could be anyone. Loving God, let us once again experience the miracle of hearing and listening. Send your Holy Spirit to your children once again. Light a fire in our hearts, a fire of justice and love and compassion. Help us to live out the kingdom vision that you offer us. In Jesus' name, amen.
friends, on this Pentecost Sunday, let your hearts, your souls, your spirits be re-energized through the power of the Holy Spirit. May you find new life, new life in Christ, new life in community, new life in service, new life in love. Go forth, my friends, and have an awesome week. With Jesus' blessing, in Jesus' name, amen.